Thank you, Carolina, for the kind words. That's really appreciated. And also, thank you for the whole, uh, for the whole team for putting all this up. This is awesome. And it's a lot of work, I know that. So, hi all. Also, hi to the people on the live stream watching right now. So, let's get right into it. 125,000 packages on NPM. Back in March, when I proposed this talk, I said, by the time of this conference, we will have at least 10,000 packages more. And so, I checked again this morning, and what we have today is 148,000 packages. That's more than double the amount that I predicted, and this is a whole lot if you consider that NPM itself is five years old. But why am I focusing so much on quantity here? Isn't quality more important? Of course, quality is important, but this shows us something. This is a huge number. There are huge growing, uh, growth rates. So it seems like it's easy to publish, and a lot of people are doing it, which is nice. So you have to keep in mind that every package exists because there seems to be a problem. And ideally, each of these packages solves its own little problem. And if we have 148,000 of them, that's, that's pretty amazing. Like, these are all doing one thing and they're doing it well. So that's a lot to choose from. And it's, it's super incredible that we can build upon all of this. So 148,000 solved problems, that's a lot less problems if you ask me. So this is the rule of diversity in play. You can distrust one true way and compose everything the way you like. This is why we are so productive in JavaScript today. This is why Node is so popular. This is because of this ecosystem. And if you look at things like React Native, for example, one of their main advantages is that they can NPM install things, which puts them way ahead of any other native developer. So our workday looks like this. First, we go to npmsearch.com and we enter what we want to do. Then we install the package. And for every problem, we repeat that process. Then we write some glue code, or we pretend that we are actually working by installing the latest and greatest build system or arguing about semicolons, and then, then we're done. Profit. Awesome. But, of course, there's a catch. You come back after a weekend, you have changed nothing, your app is broken. You update one module and something entirely different is broken. Or it works locally, but on your CI server the tests are failing. You're, you feel like flipping tables because this is happening all the time. And you know why that is? You have to trust some strangers. We cannot know whether they are changing their modules so that they are affecting our apps, that they're breaking our apps. And how can we make sure that nothing is breaking these apps? This is what we call dependency hell. But there's already a solution for this problem. A long time ago, wise people came up with something that is called semantic versioning, or short, SEMVR, which is here to prevent exactly that. So what you see here, this is a version number, or the scheme of a version number, and SEMVR gives, gives each of these digits a precise meaning. So, for example, this is 1.0.0. This is where your module should start. And as it happens sometimes, we have bugs in our software, and what we do is we increase the patch release, uh, the patch version, so the people who are consuming our module know that we have brought them some bug fixes or security fixes. Then, if we add new functionality to our package, we increase the minor version number and reset the other one, the patch version. So this is if we add functionality. And now, last but certainly not least, is the major version, which we increase if we have broken a use case of our module that was working before. So now you know what each of these numbers stands for. And I tweeted that like two days ago. The versions are named major and minor. And I think that's, um, that's wrong because that leaves room for interpretation because people are arguing this is just a minor breaking change and that does not exist. So maybe we can just name them the breaking version, the feature version, and the patch version. So why is this so awesome? What does this give us? It gives us version ranges. So for example, if you specify your dependency with a tilde before that, 
you automatically get all the patch versions, which means you have all, all, um, all the bug fixes and all the security fixes automatically installed for you. And using the hat or carrot symbol, you will get all the bug fixes plus features, which shouldn't break your software. And this is really, really important because this prevents dependency hell. First, we, um, dependency hell, there are two things to it. The first thing is version lock, which means you de define your dependency so tightly that you don't get the bug fixes or updates, which not only affects your dependencies, but also the dependencies of your dependencies of your dependencies, and so on. So deep down the dependency tree, you might have some outdated software, which is really, really bad, especially if it's a security fix. And the other thing is version promiscuity, which means you have to lose um, version definitions, and then you get the breakings I described earlier. So Samver is really important to um, prevent that. So now we have 148,000 modules. We have Samver to prevent all of them. We can harness the power of all these modules. Well, no, we can't. Almost no day goes by without these problems occurring. And that's because we fail to follow Samber big time. This is, a lot of use, uh, this is a lot of wasted potential, and a lot of development time um, is wasted every day. But why are we failing so badly? Let me show you some examples. So what you see here is an analysis of all the packages uh, on NPM conducted by Irene Ross of Boku in late 2014. What you can see on the left are all the versions that start with a, minor, uh, a major zero version. That's over 80% of all packages on NPM. And you might have noticed that I left out major zero versions in my introduction before, and that's because they're inherently bad. Let me quote from this back. Major version zero is for initial development. Anything may change at any time. The public API should not be considered stable. What this means is that basically Samber does not apply. So Samber does not apply to 80% of all packages. You might say that these versions are unstable anyways, but I think that does not matter. First of all, some of the most popular packages on NPM, like async, grunt, forever, PM2, karma, these are the ones if you open npmjs.org, that's just the most popular things, and all of them are below 1.0.0, and they're used by thousands of people. So it seems like it doesn't apply really, that doesn't say anything about stability. And second, I think the version number is the wrong place to communicate stability. It should serve us to avoid dependency hell, and stability has nothing to do with it, because we're giving away the goodness of Samber for this. So, for example, look at what IOJS did when they first released um, it. So it was 1.0.0, but they stated on the website, this is beta, this is not stable, which they used a different channel to communicate stability, and they made um, the goodness of Samber available to all people consuming IOJS. Or look at what NPM itself does. They have tags. So when, whenever you publish a version to NPM, it gets the latest tag. So if you install a package, you don't get the package with the highest version number, but you get the package with the latest tag, which means if you publish a new version without the latest tag, but with something like Next, you can have real next versions in the Samber sense, but the majority of your users won't install it automatically. Only your early adopters can specifically install it, test it, and then if you have a bug, you just publish the next version, and you can still use Samver and still communicate stability. So this is welcome to Samver, the good parts. Just do not use versions below 1.0.0. Next, so we have a dependency and there's a breaking change. And now we cannot automatically update that, so we do that by hand, and then we go on the GitHub site, and there's the tags, but there's no, there's no indication of what changed, and there's no blog post or nothing, basically. And what should we do? Should we read through the code? Should we read every line? I mean, that's why we're using libraries, so that we don't have to. So it's a huge problem that we don't have change logs because we cannot upgrade or migrate our software if we don't know what happened. 
but there's hope. This is an actual changelog from AngularJS, and this is generated from commit messages. And there are people that argue that commit messages are super bad for changelogs, but that's only if you copy them in directly. What AngularJS did, they came up with commit message conventions. So you can see in the first section under bug fixes HTTP, they're grouped together by the affected module, and also you have bug fix feature, performance improvement, and breaking changes sections. You have links to the specific commit and also to the issues that are affected. So this is basically like if you would have written it by hand. And generating them is super useful. But this leads us directly to the next problem. You see the last version is not a zero, so this is a patch release. And then what's this? Features and breaking changes in the patch release. That shouldn't happen. Um, I think that's kind of ironic. They have a completely automated system to generate the change lock, and still they're releasing a patch version, even though they are clearly stating that this is a breaking version. What's the point of this if they don't follow a specific scheme for their um, versions? And in Germany, we have a word for this. It's Hauptversionsnummern Erhöhungsangst. And that's, <laughs> that means, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> that means the fear of increasing the major version. And that's what makes us fail at assembler the most. They have clearly written down that they are breaking changes, but they are not increasing the major version. Why is that? Or the breaking version, sorry. There's no reason except for maybe marketing reasons or emotional attachment to versions. There is this concept in our mind that the version has something to say about the project, like the progress or the stability. And all of this is wrong. People believe something incredibly exciting is happening if the major version is increased. And just yesterday, Nolan Lawson from PouchDB tweeted this. They released the major version, uh, the breaking version, sorry, 3.0.0 of PouchDB, where they only removed a feature, which was, of course, a breaking release. And suddenly, they got a lot of press coverage, a lot of new stars, the usage increased, and all they did was remove a feature. So. <laughs> There's clearly something wrong with that. Leave your emotions out of this. So here's a quote from Jeremy Ashkenaz, the author, author of Backbone, Underscore, and Coffee Script, and he's particularly well known for not caring about Samba at all. So he said, if you strictly followed semantic versioning, it would probably be Backbone JS 43.0.0 by now, which doesn't help anyone evaluate the actual progress of the project evaluate the actual progress of the project. He says he's not following a specific scheme and he just makes things up. So how should this be possible? Like, how should things be trackable or comparable if he's not following any standard? So here's the thing. We as humans, <coughs> sorry, we as humans cannot track anything from version numbers. We cannot get anything out of it. This is the real illusion. So there are even wilder, sorry, I forgot the amazing animation. So there are even wilder concepts like odd or even version numbers, for example, in Node.js, where if it's odd version number, it's unstable, and if it's even, it's stable. Or I came across something recently that says 0 0.7, during initial development, 0 0.8, completed draft undergoing review, 0 0.9, final draft of review, 1.0, first release version. So don't do this. Don't attach additional meaning to version numbers. This is utter and complete nonsense. So let me tell you something. Versions are not for humans, or better, nothing good will ever come from making version numbers for humans. To, illust to illustrate this point, I'd like to show you um, the early example from Angular. So you see two screenshots, and there are two repositories, and both of these repositories are Angular. So what's the difference, or what's the point of this? Well, one says AngularJS, one says Angular, whatever. Um, actually, they are for the different versions. So one repository for 1.x and the other repository for 2.x. 
I'm not sure if it's just me or is this completely ridiculous. The Angular team reserved the major version not for breaking changes, but for changes that are so fundamental that they require an entirely different repo, and also people are complaining that there is no upgrade path. So isn't it something entirely different? Here's how they could fix it. Of course, this is just a placeholder, but you can't just use a new name if it's so fundamentally different. Versions are not for humans, names are. And this goes the same for packages that, that are in early de development. A lot of people tell me they just want to play around and then they start with zero whatever because it gives them some kind of security or something. The thing is, the most of the time that, get waste, that gets wasted before we start developing is bike shedding around the name of a package. So here's my proposal. You just give it whatever package name, and then you start, and you might be at version 14.0.0 or 35.0.0, and at the time you feel it's stable and it's worthwhile, you can just change the name and start over. That's for human communication. So. Here's a quote from my dear friend, Stefan Seid, who's also watching. Hi, Stefan. Um, he's a huge source of inspiration for me, and you should ch check out his talks and listen to what he says. I'm serious. So here's the quote. Our tools are so bad, we value human readability in computer protocols when it really doesn't fucking matter. And whenever I have to waste time because someone doesn't follow, Samra just depresses me and, like, how terrible is everything? But the talk wasn't named We Failed to Follow Samber and Everything is Terrible. It's We Failed to Follow Samber and Why It Needn't Matter. So this is because it's possible to, remo to remove humans entirely from this process. Humans are the ones who are messing this up with their emotions, and this is why I built something to remove them from that process. So it's not so live life coding because it relies a bit on the network. So I have a video recording, but let's see how that goes. So we will develop a module together. And what you see here is a new module, a new repository I created. Um, it doesn't have any releases, just some boilerplate code like the package JSON or, is it playing? Yeah. Just the package JSON, Travis, uh, YM, uh, Travis CI configuration, so the tests are running and everything. Okay. This is bad, the video doesn't play on my screen. Okay, whatever, I'll just do it this way. So, I'm typing this right now. Um, the thing is, it's not that there are no releases on GitHub yet, and it's not on NPM. So here is my test file. I've set it up already, and the code doesn't really matter, so I'm just testing a function that sums up numbers that you put into it. And so we want to, have to put in some numbers like one and four, and the expected result is five. Um, and if we put just one number in, we just want to have that number back. So we're now trying to execute these tests, and of course they are failing because there is no implementation yet. So you see there is five expected, but we just get undefined. So let's implement this function. We have this all set up, so what I'm doing is I am converting the arguments array to a proper array, because yay, JavaScript. And then I'm simply reducing the arguments down to a single digit by adding up the previous and the current simple reduce case. And now the tests are passing, or at least they should, which of course they will because it's video, yay. <laughs> so I now have these two changed files and I add them and I create a commit. And now this is an important step because I talked about commit message conventions. So this is a neat thing, actually. 
you can just type git commit and then your favorite editor opens and you can just write super verbose commit messages if you like. You just don't have, you don't have to put them in this one line. And what we're doing is we're defining a type and this is a feature release because the function is a new feature. And then we have a scope, which is the sum function, and then we describe what happens, so we added the basic sum functionality. And we save that commit message and push it up to GitHub. So yeah, you can see I have created four commits before, now I'm pushing that to GitHub. And now we are on Travis, and magically the build just started immediately, I don't know why that happened. And we see the tests are running, and after the tests are running, my module comes into play. So what it's doing is it's analyzing all the commits that have happened since the last version, or if there's no version yet, all the versions. And then it generates the change log from Angular, and then it sees, okay, there's a new feature version. But in this case, it's no version yet, so it simply releases 1.0.0, exactly as I pointed out. We just want to start with 1.0.0, and you don't have to care about this. So now it just published this to GitHub, including the change log, and also on npm js.org, we can see that there's the publish module, and I guess you will all use it because it's so awesome. Let's get back to the tests. Now we want to add a feature. So we, just, we don't just want to add up numbers, but also um, numbers that are stringified. So here's a test case for that. We sum up one and a string four, and that should give us five. You know what, I'll just switch to real C player, this is annoying. So tests are failing. Now we're going back to the implementation where we now add an initial, sorry, that should not happen. You could have said that earlier. Um, <laughs> so I've just added an initial value of zero to the reduce case and I'm converting the current number to a number. Now the tests are passing and just like before, I'm committing this with the feature type, and it's the sum scope, and I say, okay, now stringified numbers are supported. And now is the time where I remember that I actually have to add the files first. And then I push it up. Ah, oh, this is bad. Now I have version 1.0.0 on GitHub, and there's a change log again, and on NPM there's the new version 1.1.0, just magically without me having to waste any resources on that or just to make a wrong decision. So next up is a sum should have at least two arguments. So I'm changing the tests here that if you just input one argument, it shouldn't give you back the argument, but it um, should throw an error um, so that the person who is using this module knows that they're probably doing something wrong because there's no point in summing up just one number. And again, the tests, they're failing. Now let's implement this. It's simple. Can I It's a simple if case, so if arguments.length is smaller than two, I just um, throw a new error. Again, the tests are now passing, and then I create my new 
commit message, which again is a feature, it's about the sum, and it now throws an error messages for less than two arguments. And now if you have looked closely, this is a breaking change, because before, if you were relying on the behavior of just giving back the one argument, then you cannot use that anymore because suddenly it will throw an error. And this is why I'll um, declare this breaking change with the Angular commit message conventions in this commit, except for I'm doing not because this is boring. Like, this is a breaking change, and I'm not declaring it because I'm just like everyone else. And now I'm going to publish this to GitHub. So, yeah. And again, the Travis build. And we see that the actual tests of the module, of course, passed. But the deploy script checks out the test folder of the latest released version. So there's this breaking change detection. And it checks out the old test folder, the old package JSON, installs the old dev dependencies, and basically runs your old test suite against the current version. And now suddenly the tests are failing which is a detected breaking change. And that's what this, the output isn't optimized yet, but it's showing you that there's an error and that the verification failed. So this time, this feature wasn't published because there's an undeclared breaking change. And if you look at the GitHub releases thing, there's no new version, even if I reload twice. And also on NPM, there is no new version, which is a good thing. So it didn't just publish a, a major new version on its own, because without the instructions on how to upgrade, this would be useless. Like, as I said, a, a breaking change without migration instructions is worthless. So I've just pasted in the breaking change declaration. I pushed it back to GitHub. And now there's version 2.0.0 exactly as it should be. And it doesn't matter. It's 2.0.0, and it has five commits, but th this does not matter, OK? Um, so here is the module. It got published entirely without me caring about it. So actually, I cared about it, but not in this precise moment. So the module you just saw is semantic release. You can find it on GitHub, and you can also find it on NPM. And it's published using itself, so I hope there are no breaking changes biting your ass or something. And I, I really want to ask you to try this out and to use this for your own packages. And also, the commit message conventions are the Angular commit message conventions, and the changelog generation is the Angular changelog. But you can just plug in whatever you want, so you can um, define your own commit message convention style and base it on that, or you can modify the release, uh, the changelog before it's published, so you can, I don't know, add a funny GIF before it's published to GitHub. You can basically plug in whatever you want. And this is... Um, CI server agnostic, so you can um, use Travis CI, which you should because they're awesome, but you can use other things and you can contribute configuration for other services and also you can just try, uh, try it out or see if you can find bugs in there. So we really need to invest more in this topic because Semver is too powerful and important for humans to once more ruin everything. Thank you. Well, that was so good. Uh, so now we're going to argue about software, are we, right? I mean, are there any questions? I didn't see any on Twitter, so I'm assuming there are plenty right here, second row. Hey, thank you. Uh, what do you think about shrink wrapping your NPM depths? Yeah, that's what you should do if you're developing an application. So if you're shrink wrapping your modules that are supposed to be used by other modules, then 
the version log appears. So if there are new bug fixes or security fixes, they can trickle down the dependency tree. But if you're building your own application, you should, of course, use um, shrink wrap. So I'll explain it for everyone. Shrink wrap basically um, looks at your repository and writes your current state of the dependency tree into a file. And whenever you install it, you uh, just get that exact copy of the dependency tree so you can run into um, arbitrary SAMR fails if you want to build an application or deploy a new application. So yeah, that's what you should use for your application. Thank you. More questions? There is one in the middle. I think like the upper section is sleeping. Hi. So in your presentation, you've uh, established a way to remove humans from uh, uploading packages and versioning. But what do you propose to do about people writing change logs and commit messages? I mean, forget change logs, commit messages. Yeah, so that's an important part. You need to make this a process of your um, Reviewing pull requests, all team members have to agree on these conventions. Um, that's true that they're an important and integral part of this. That's also why I um, came up with the breaking change detection thing, to kind of have a security net if people don't follow the commit message conventions. But of course, you need to have those correct. But the thing is that you just have to argue about the one change in your code, and you can describe it. So if you have, like you have before, you have a new version and you're breaking something, and like the Angular team, you can just write it's a breaking change, but you don't use the correct version, then you can't pretend you're smart or something because we're doing versions differently. But in this, um, in this setup, if you have a breaking change and you don't declare it, that you cannot argue being smart or anything. It's just not being nice to your users. So yeah, you should, you should um, really um, get the commit messages right. But the thing is, that's not a matter of using semantic release, because you could, should do this anyway. So writing precisely what you have done is really important. And you shouldn't just write changed something or use loyal commits to just dump anything in. Um, writing what you have changed is really important to communicate with uh, other team members and also open source uh, contributors, potential ones. Thank you. So the, the fact of the matter is that versioning is also important to humans. Like, for example, we, Web 2.0 was a huge buzzword. So if you propose that versioning should be only for robots, what would you propose for humans? So as I said, um, we can just use names. And that's not only the package name. For example, there are things like release names, which um, some people do. So after the version, version is published, um, and you see sorry, that this was an important commit or a new feature. You can just attach release names to your versions and then just write a blog post about module X, Y, Z, and then give it an animal name. So you have something to talk about, that, but that doesn't necessarily have to be the version number. I think what we're getting at here is like we should use Ballastar Galactica ship names for you know, yeah. names of releases instead of numbers. So like. Just go home and do that. That's the thing. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's what we did for, um, for Hoodie. We just um, generated a random animal, and then we put that animal against the Giphy API. And so we had the release nodes with an animal name and also a matching um, animal GIF, which is awesome. Um, any more questions? I think I saw, yeah, there's a hand over there in the middle. And there's another hand at the very end. I can totally see you. Who's first? Where, where, where? Put up your hand. Um, how should we treat uh, undocumented slash untested features? So for example, in your quick sum module. Uh, somebody might be using it to concat strings before you release the first feature. And that would be a breaking change, but you didn't account for that. Yeah, that's the Sember um, spec is actually about the public API. And that's a bit difficult, because public API isn't very much um, a defined term. So some people say it's 
um, what's documented, and other people say it's that what's covered by tests, but I'd say if you're in doubt, just increase the major version number. Because I, if I can add to that, what we are having now is that we simply cannot update modules. We have to do everything manually, and we have to check everything again and again and again. So this is the current state. Having too many major versions isn't a thing, because manually updating packages is what we are currently at. So if you just um, use major versions a lot, that's no problem, or it shouldn't be. Uh, hi. Thanks for the presentation. One question. Uh, if we would use this semantic version and we would increase the first number, the mayor version, every time, we would have really huge numbers. And you said that it's okay. We don't want to do it because of the emotions and marketing, but marketing is part of the packages. You know, when you, I don't know, try to search some markdown bouncer and you have, I don't know, 1,000 results because we are a JavaScript community, so there's so many packages and libraries for everything. You also check the number of you know, uh, commits and version and probably the date and release history and everything. So, because you want to be sure that it probably someone maintains it and it's, you know, it's up to date. So it's yeah, just that's part, it's, you know, part of the package is also marketing. So. Yeah, so what I said, first you can use names for release names for marketing and also I guess it's just an arbitrary number. So if people aren't following Sember or what precisely are you reading from it? So it's just, just a feeling. So for example, most excellent modules like Browserify or Harpy are at 8.0 or 9.0, or IOJS released uh, version 2.0 just, I don't know, not even half a year after the first release. And this is an arbitrary feeling you're based on anyways. And you think you can read something from it, but you can't. Okay, we have a last question from Twitter, not even from my phone. Um, could we use tests instead of version numbers? Hi, Stefan. <laughs> um, for example, my dependencies say use latest code that passes these tests. Yeah, that would be. As I said, you have to listen to Stefan. He is just, if you think you're onto something, he's always on the next step of things. So, <laughs> yeah, using tests for, for versions, that's also great. Yeah, definitely. Okay, um, we have a coffee break upcoming, so upstairs can wake up. <laughs> and um, yeah, I'm really happy that you embarked on a mission of like tackling this amazingly controversial topic of versioning and like semantics and software, and you did it so well. So I hope everyone is going to try that because I'm excited about trying it, and I would try it right now if I could, but I'm busy emceeing. Uh, so yeah, thank you Stefan so much and we all are going to have coffee now. <laughs>